Okay, so let's do our second topic here. If I sit here, I'm right in your way, aren't I? Here, let me sit over here more than. Okay, so let's do our second topic on on um, basically properties of light. That's what we're kind of going through right now. We're going to go through um, what scientists knew as well as what we still know. It's not like this isn't you know, false information I'm teaching you. But we have to build our way through the 1800s and talk about how all of these discoveries ultimately led to the quantum revolution in the year 1900, give or take. So what I want to talk about today is the property of reflection. Okay. This property is something that scientists have known about all the way back to Sir Isaac Newton's time, because really it's what led him to originally believe that light was a particle of some type, because it can bounce off of things. I mean, literally ever since, I don't know, man has been able to look into a lake, for example, you've been able to see a mirror image of things, right? I mean, I, that's where I'm starting with this picture right here. The idea of things being able to reflect or bounce, right? I mean, so you can see this picture right here, right? The idea where this is where the actual tree and skies are. But if you look at the lake itself on a pristinely calm day, it reflects, right? I mean, basically it's acting as a mirror. We know that all light reflects, right? How are you seeing each other? Light is bouncing off of your friend. Some of it, some of the EMR that is coming from the source of light, some of it's getting absorbed, but some of it's getting reflected and it transmits that to your eyes. So here is the law of reflection I need you all to know. Uh, hopefully you've taken math 20-1. Are you guys familiar with the absolute value function of y equals the absolute value of x? Hopefully. Basically, what this means is if you were to have a graph, if you have something that comes in, it's going to bounce back out the exact same way. And the theory is, is that if you were to cut it in half right here at like the vertex of the, uh, of like the point right there, whatever incoming angle something comes in at, it bounces out at the exact same angle. So if it comes in at 20 degrees, it's going to bounce out at 20 degrees every single time. Always. That is the law of reflection. And so if you have a nice smooth surface like this, like a mirror or like a lake, what happens is regular reflection happens and light bounces in, it bounces back out, and all of your rays end up being parallel to each other. And so you can see a nice, a nice mirror image of the, of the trees over here. That same law of reflection still applies over here when the lake is a little bit... Um, you know, like there's ripples on the pond, because here's what's happening. This ray right here comes in, bounces back out at a perfect angle. But so does this one. The problem is the surface is kind of in a different spot. See how the surface was right here in the first example? And, and now it's a little different. And then this one's really different, and this one's different some more. What ends up happening is all of the rays that were coming in and bouncing off the lake, they were all parallel, but when they left, they kind of scattered. And the word we use for that is they diffuse. And what ends up happening is now you don't get a nice shiny image. And you guys can probably guess by the mirrors that I have here, we're going to focus mostly on things that have reflection that bounces out in nice, even, smooth sort of patterns. But I mean, that same pr principle is still what allows me to see everything around you, right? Light is bouncing off of that shirt right there and going in every single direction, some of the directions towards my eyes, therefore I can see you. Anyways, this was evidence of particle model. Okay. Here's some terms I need you guys to know. I, I'm not a teacher who reads off my slides, so you guys can look at these a little bit later, but here's some terms you need. Uh, we're going to work with ray diagrams. Incident light is light that uh, is going to be bouncing off of an object. Reflected is the light that just bounced. Okay. Uh, point of incidence would be like that V in the bottom of the absolute value graph. Uh, angles have to be the same as each other. Ooh, here's one, normal line. A normal line would be that, uh, that dotted line that we kind of drew, cutting it right in half there. So, anyways, I'm going to move on because you guys can read. Here would be a couple of pictures I found off the internet that kind of help explain how reflection works. If an incoming ray of light bounces off a mirror, it would then bounce over here, which would mean that, like, let's say that I was standing over here, and there was a wall right here but there was an object over here. Even though I cannot directly see the object because there's a wall in the way, hopefully you get this concept, if I were to look at the mirror over here, I would see this object. 
Now, a lot of times we kind of envision that like the person, you, sh you might think that you should be drawing the rays from the person's eyes to the mirror and then from the mirror to the object, but that's not how things work. Your eyes don't shoot out laser beams, right? Unless any of you here are part of the X-Men. Okay, I didn't think so. Anyways, because what's really happening is light is hitting this object. Light from all directions is hitting this object. And some of that light is being absorbed. Most of that light is probably being absorbed. However, some of it is being reflected. And it's being reflected in many different directions. One of the directions the light's going to get reflected is now in this direction here. And then the light will then hit the mirror, bounce off the mirror, and eventually make its way to my eyes so I can see. But you need to make sure I'm really clear on this. Don't draw ray diagrams going from a person's eyes to the object. That's what we think of. What's really happening is light is bouncing off the object, then off the mirror, then to you so you can see it. Um, here's another kind of picture illustrating the same thing, but now I want to bring in a new term of vocabulary. The word we use is called a virtual image. Okay. What a virtual image refers to is the fact that when you're seeing something in the mirror, you're not actually seeing the real object, you're seeing something that looks like the object. The best way I describe this is when I, like, I have three little girls, three kids, and every single time that I've brought them in front of the mirror for the first time, and like a one-year-old sees themselves in a mirror, I don't know if you've ever seen this before, but like when a one-year-old sees themselves in the mirror, their, their other eyes light up, right? Because all of a sudden they see themselves, and when they, they all of a sudden recognize, that's me in the mirror, and you can literally see like a little child recognize that. Well, the, are they actually seeing another person inside the mirror? No, they're just seeing themselves. They're seeing a virtual image, right? I think we, we as, as adults, we don't have that same sense of wonder, but I gotta tell you, like when my when my little kids look in the mirror for the first time and they, they see themselves and they think it's amazing, that's that's what I think of virtual image. Right? Because here's what's happening. This person right here is seeing an object that feels like it's like behind the mirror. They're seeing themselves in a mirror, but they're not really seeing something that's back here. They're seeing something that's actually the light ray has bounced this way over there. We call this thing then a virtual image. Does that make sense? So when you're seeing something in the mirror, likely you're seeing a virtual image. I've got a couple of flash animations here that hopefully will work that kind of illustrate a couple of uh, principles here. Let's let it run a couple of times here. You guys can see here that um, all of these rays here, they're kind of bouncing out, they're all bouncing, and right here is where you're gonna perceive the image to be. You have to watch this a few times, I think. Here's where the actual object is. This is the actual object. The actual object sends light rays out in all directions and they bounce off the mirror. Well, as they bounce off the mirror, see how they all bounced off with a nice absolute value equal shape? If we were to continue all of these lines, the image appears to have emanated from this location back here. We call that the virtual image. And if I could, I need you guys to kind of come to my table up here. I'm gonna do a quick little demo and try to illustrate how that looks. So you have to kind of come up here, you need to go mobile for a bit. I want to show you a quick little demo here. So I don't have very large mirrors here, unfortunately, which is a bit of a pain in the butt. But here's what I'm going to do. I need for you guys to be able to go down so that you can see into the mirror. So you're going to actually have to be able to get a little bit lower. And I'm going to put... I'm gonna put this marker right there. And so hopefully what you're gonna be able to see is like the bottom half of the marker, but you're gonna to have to like, you have to look flat on, okay? So yeah, like duck down, okay? So if you duck down, like for me, from my perspective, I see the marker right on this part right here. But like I imagine where everybody else is looking, if, if I were to say that the marker was right here, you'd say, no, that's not true, right? If I were to move my finger to here, does anybody see the marker right underneath my finger? Perfect. If I move my finger to right here, does anybody see the marker about there? Okay. So everybody's perspective is about different. Here's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to try to place another marker behind it. And sorry, I'm just changing my perspective here. Nope. Well, actually, I should be able to do the math here. It needs to be about there. And so now, regardless of where I'm looking, does it seem like in the mirror you now see the bottom half of the marker, but it lines up with the top? Okay, so 
here's what I've now helped illustrate to you. What you are seeing in the mirror right here, watch the illustration again on the screen now. This was the actual marker, and I don't care where you were looking from. Someone was looking from over here. Someone was here, someone was here, someone was here, someone was here. But we all perceive the marker as being on the other side of the mirror in this location right here. And so right here behind the mirror, we all, we all, we perceive the marker as emanating from there, but it's, it's not, we know that. Does that kind of help explain though what a virtual image is? Is that you're all, regardless of where you're seeing it, you're feeling it from the same spot? Okay, cool, okay, you guys can head back, but hopefully that demo kind of explained what I'm referring to here. Where's my board again? Okay, so here's some more diagrams. A lot, a lot of this is theory to start with. There's, there's very little math we're gonna do. Uh, like I said, sorry, today's a day where I'm talking at you for like a full hour plus. Uh, here's another example here. Imagine that there's an object right here, that like just like what we just saw, right? This is a whiteboard marker, and all of you are in different locations. You all had to look at different perspectives to see the marker. I, who was over here on the far side right here, I had to look over here for light to bounce off and come see me, right? which means that I perceived the image to be behind the screen right there in a straight line. But somebody else has the exact same perspective just from the other side of the mirror. The cool thing here though, the thing I need to point out is if you were too far away, if you are Ray Zovlite, who I don't know who that is, but I found this online, so. If you are Ray and you're standing way over here, if you were trying to look to this spot right here, see how this person right here is aiming up with the image? This person's aiming up with the image, this person's aiming up with the image. Well, if this guy right here aims up with the image in the same spot right there, would Ray actually see anything? Well, no, because the mirror didn't reach far enough. But if the mirror did reach far enough, the ray of light would have bounced. Now, make sure, I want to make sure I'm clear, though. The ray of light should actually be drawn like this. It was coming in like this. Shh, please, guys. i got to talk for a long time today. The ray is actually coming this way though. Make sure you're clear that it's going from the object off the mirror to the person. But again, if there is no mirror over there, there is no image back here. That's why we call it a virtual image because it's not actually real. There's nothing there. We just perceive it as being there. One of the most common places that people will play mirror tricks, there's really two I can think of. One is in like a fun house where you know, you're supposed to like, you know, stand in the fun house and mirrors will play optical illusions on your eyes. Probably the more important one though, magicians will use mirrors a lot in order to try to make objects disappear or to try to play an optical illusion on you. So. Oh yeah, I gotta move forward here. Plane mirrors are flat mirrors and plane mirrors are pretty boring. There's not a whole lot that's special about them. I need to spend some time today though talking with you guys about concave and convex mirrors. And those are the mirrors that I originally had up here. If you guys aren't familiar with them, uh, here are the two types. So I'll see that I can have them both lean here a little bit without falling over. Right, maybe I should grab a second stand. Give me one sec here. Do I have one for each? Okay, so class, here are the two different types of mirrors, there we go, that are curved. This one right here is called a concave mirror, and this one over here is called a convex. I don't know whether this helps anybody else, but the way I memorize it is that this one is a little bit inset, kind of like a cave almost. This is like a cave in a rock. So this one doesn't have a huge amount of curvature to it, but hopefully you can see from wherever you're at. This one's not flat, it's got a bit of a, an indent to it. Okay. This one over here is a convex mirror, and it's the opposite, basically. It kind of protrudes outwards. And each of these mirrors has different properties depending on how you, how you use them. Um, one of the most common ways that kids will actually know about mirrors before I even teach them is from a spoon. If you ever looked at your reflection in a spoon, it's a little different if you look from the back side of the spoon to the front side of the spoon. Sometimes your image is right side up. 
sometimes it's upside down. And so my goal over the next, I don't know, half an hour, how much longer I have, is I want to explain some of the principles behind how mirrors work, specifically when they are curved. So I got some more key terms I need you guys to know. Again, I'm not going to spend long on this slide because you guys can copy it down later. Um, the terms we need to know are center, focal point, principal axis, vertex, object, and image. Okay, there we go. You guys can write that down in a sec. Let me show you this on an example here. This is your curved mirror. Would this be an example of a concave or a convex mirror? Concave, because it's bending inwards, kind of like a cave. It's kind of inset. Fellas? Shh. Okay, now in terms of how this works, a mirror is actually a part of a sphere. You have to almost imagine that if you could, this mirror right here that's curved, it actually would fit like a circular pattern. It is not drawn overly well, but if you kind of kept this going in all directions, what we have is like a snippet, a portion of what would have been a sphere, okay? Which means that all mirrors have what's known as a center, just like how a circle has a center. There is a center to this mirror because the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from there to there, is the same as the distance from there to there. There exists a point somewhere well behind the mirror here where the distance is the exact same to the mirror in all directions. Okay. We call that the center. However, the center itself is actually not that important. What matters more is the point called F. And F stands for the focal point. Okay. Uh, the math basically is that the focal point is half of your radius. Okay. If from here to here, is a radius, a focal point is half of that. And the focal point is a very significant uh, location whenever we're doing curved mirror drawings. And I'm going to show you why in a, in a little while here, but that, that's one of the key points right here is the focal point. Okay. Now, when we do line drawings, we're often going to draw an object. And, and just to make things simple, we often draw objects as arrows, just to keep it simple. But uh, eventually we can make more sophisticated drawings, but this could be an object. And what ends up happening is we draw some like some ray diagrams where we draw some lines bouncing off the object, off the mirror. And like this would be another one. We're going to take a, a line. We're going to draw it from the object off the mirror. And what we try to figure out is where all of these diagram lines, where they converge. And, and that's where the image is going to show up. This thing right here would be an object. This right here describes an image. And sometimes an image is uh, enlarged, meaning it's, it's bigger. Sometimes it's diminished, meaning it's smaller. Sometimes it's erect, meaning right side up. Sometimes it's inverted, meaning it's upside down. In this particular example right here, we seem to have a scenario where your image is upside down. And uh, to try to illustrate that to you, I need for you guys to basically, if you can, take a look in the mirror here from a long distance away. It may not be in focus, but like at some point, maybe later today, if it doesn't work right now, can you try to see something in the background? Because it should be upside down. Can you see anything in this mirror? Right? Hopefully it's upside down. Right? But if you were to hold it really close to you, like right where, where I'm standing right here, you won't see what I'm seeing. I see myself in the mirror because when I'm close up, it works a little different. But if I were then to hold the mirror here, We're good? Oh, yeah. Woo! That could have been bad. <laughs> if I were to then stand further and further away, like right now, I see, from my perspective, I see the whiteboard upside down. Right? Does anybody want to come try this real quick, even? Because I think this works well. Do you guys trust me? <laughs> you trust me? Right? Play, play with this later, right? But like, from where I'm looking at right here, I actually see the whiteboard upside down right now. I don't see myself, I see the whiteboard upside down. But if I come closer, all of a sudden I see myself. So why don't I do this? At the end of class, you guys try out the mirrors maybe. Because maybe, maybe this is more of a one-on, like you try it by yourself sort of thing. Plus maybe I'll break them otherwise. Okay, here's the rules you guys need to know in terms of trying to figure out how this works. Okay. Here's your three rules. Rule number one, any ray that goes parallel to the principal axis. That's what PA stands for, principal axis. Any ray that was parallel to the principal axis 
always reflects through the focal point. Okay. Can you guys see this blue ray right here? How it was coming in parallel to our straight on axis right here? Well, what ends up happening is when this ray bounces off the mirror, the same law of reflection applies. It still got cut directly in half, half and half each way, but what happens is any parallel rays always bounce through what's known as our focal point. Second rule, any ray that goes through the focal point always reflects back parallel to the principal axis. So suggest there was a ray that came in like this and it went through the focal point. When it hits the mirror, the way the math works out is that it always, again, cuts in half equally here. I didn't draw that very well at all. It cuts in half equally and it bounces back parallel. The third rule is that anything that goes through the center always bounces right back through the center. That's the key characteristic of the center of your circle, is that if you had a ray that went right through the center, it would then hit the mirror and then come right back again. Okay. And what we're going to do over the next couple minutes here is what's called a ray diagram. We're going to try to make a prediction as to, with the type of mirror and the location of objects, are you going to see the objects really big or really small? Are you going to see them upside down or not? Okay. I think we just need to hop into some examples. I've got some flash animations first, and then let's do some examples. So here's an example. Let's say that you have an object here. Here you have an object, and light bounces off the object in all directions. So bear with me. It's going to have to run through a few times. Light's going to bounce off in all directions. This person here is going to see the object. This person here is going to see the object. I wish I could pause this, but I don't think I can. What ends up happening is all of the lines kind of converged right here. Can you guys see how every single person converged right there? That is where the image is going to appear to people. So when I look in the mirror right here, if I look this way, I'll see the image. If a person over here looks, maybe I can draw on top. Maybe this will help. I always find this frustrating. There we go. Okay. I'll just draw on top of what they have here. Okay. So here's a, a ray of light coming through here it's going to bounce through the focal point. And therefore, a person, this is an eye over here, a person over here would then see light go bounce, bounce, and it shows up in this person's eye. Okay. But light doesn't just bounce just in one direction. It bounces in many directions. So let's, I'll just trace another line here. Let's say that light now goes, there we go, this way. So now light's going to bounce this direction. It would then bounce off the mirror and bounce towards a person over here. This person here has to aim this way to see this object. Person in green has to look straight on to see the object. I'm going to draw one more just to prove the point here. Where's the last one? There's another one. Okay, I'll do this one now. And let's say that another person is over here. So remember how I had the mirror out front there and we were all looking at it from a different perspective? This person over here in purple, where do they need to look to see the object? They need to look this way. This person needs to look this way. And this person needs to look this way. Everyone has to look in a slightly different direction to see the object that's way over here. Well, since everybody is looking in the same spot, everybody has to look at this location right here. And if everybody looks here, they will actually see this object over here. Does that make sense the way I'm describing that? Right? This person doesn't actually look at the object. This person looks, if I were to put an angle on this, this person has to look at an angle of like say 45 degrees. This person right here has to look at an angle of zero degrees. This person right here has to look at an angle of, let's call it 320 degrees. Every person here has to look at a different angle in order to see the exact same object, and they're all seeing it if they look at this location. And so that's why we call this the image location. Let me try a few more of these animations here. What ends up happening here is kind of the same thing. If a person was over here looking, they would see the candle, because the candle is going to make light go here, and then it's going to make light go here. Okay, so I should actually have a person over here. A person here would then have to look this way to see the candle. A person over here, so this is person one, this is person two. A person over here would have to look this way. These two people are looking in slightly different locations, 
but right here is where you have to look. If you look right here, you'll see this. That's kind of how the math works. Right? So same thing, when, when I put the mirror back up again, right? Take two people, right? Stand like a little distance away from each other, pick an object and say, okay, I can see the clock. Can you see the clock? Right? And I'm gonna have to look this way to see the clock. You're gonna have to look this way to see the exact same thing based on the curved image. Okay, I gotta keep moving on. Sometimes the way it works is that the rays actually converge as though they're behind the screen. We've already had that happen before, where what you're seeing is a virtual image. And you're seeing an image that is much bigger because the way the ray lines work is you're seeing something that's behind the object. Isn't this very similar to when you were seeing the object behind, like right here? Every single person here was perceiving the image as though it was on the other side of the mirror. Sometimes that happens too. So this would be a flash animation that tries to describe that right here. The way these lines work here is that this goes this way and then goes this way. And so there's a person over here trying to look. But another ray line ends up going this way and then that way. And so then a person over here tries to look. Now, none of these lines converged anywhere, but if you kind of extrapolate them backwards, both people are seeing the candle as though it's behind the mirror over here, and they see like a really big candle instead. So. Okay, I think that's enough pictures. I gotta get to some examples. You guys can look at those in a bit here. Um, these are the main two diagrams you need to be able to do. This would be a, a ray diagram trying to explain how if you look into a concave mirror, it would then explain how you can see a small upside down image. So sometime later today, grab the big concave mirror and try to find something that looks upside down. But say you take the object and you move it way closer to the mirror, take the object, put it right next to the mirror, you'd actually see, based on the way these ray diagrams work, you would see the image become very large. You'll have to try this. Let's do an example. If you don't have notes printed off, maybe try to draw this freehand, I guess. If you have notes printed off, this is a really common task we're gonna do. It's called drawing a ray diagram. What we're gonna do is we're gonna make a prediction as to what it's going to look like when you have an object next to a convex mirror. This right here is a convex mirror because you can see how the, uh, the object is kind of going towards the, the rounded side. So that I can avoid breaking this this time. Okay. So here, here's a convex mirror. Everybody look at the convex mirror. What do you see? Because it really shouldn't matter where you're at. Perfect. Yeah, I can see I can see all you guys in the corner over there. Right? Okay. I, I gotta keep moving here though. Based on us looking in the mirror, I'm gonna make a couple predictions. I believe that the images are gonna be upright because nothing was upside down in this particular mirror. But I also believe everything's going to be smaller. Does that make sense? Everything here looks like it's smaller, because it all looks like it's kind of compressed in the mirror, but it's also still the right direction up. Okay? We're gonna use some ray diagrams and try to describe that. Here's how this works. The focal point is actually on the inside of the mirror. Can you guys see how this is like, this, this dome right here is like almost part of a sphere? The focal point is somewhere back here, and the center is over here, because this is part of a, basically a big ball where only part of it is existing. Right? So here's the focal point. Let's do some ray diagrams. The first one that I'm gonna do is I'm going to try to draw a line as though it's going parallel. Now, one of the fundamental rules of how this works is that any line that goes parallel always deflects as though it came from the focus. Now, can light actually go on the other side of this mirror? Well, no, the mirror reflects it, but it's gonna emanate as though it came from the focal point. So what's gonna happen is light is actually going to bend in what's known as like a diffuse. It's going to go outward. This is how light is going to go. You see that? Light's gonna come from this object, it's gonna hit the mirror, and it's gonna bounce outwards. And it's gonna come as though it came from the focal point. This angle right here is basically like if there was a normal line in here, this would be equal angles on both sides. So that'd be my first line right here. 
Now I'm going to do another one. I'm going to draw a line that uh, tries to go through the focal point. I'm going to try to make my line go through the focal point. But unfortunately, light cannot go through this mirror right here. So even though light was trying to get to the focal point, it's then going to bounce off like this. And so light is going to then take this path. You guys, you need to pay attention here. Light's going to go like this. It's going to try to hit the focal point. It can't because it's hitting a mirror. And light's going to then bounce this way. Well, I don't have any lines that converged. However, for a person who is standing over here, this is an eyeball, a person standing over here thinks that light came from here. And a person that's standing over here thinks that light came from like right here. Right here is where those lines kind of converged, which means that we should be then seeing, regardless of where your perspective is, this person right here should be seeing a somewhat smaller image. And this person right here should also be seeing a somewhat smaller image. There is a third line that we can draw as well. Remember how the focal length is supposed to be half of the, uh, of the radius? If from here to here is the focal point, then the center of the circle should be way over there. And the way that line drawings work for that is that any, any ray that tries to go to the center bounces right back on itself. Ooh, I didn't do that very well. Can I undo that? Okay, let me try this one more time. I didn't draw that very well. Say that a ray of light tried to come from this object right here. It tried to go towards the center. It would go like this. It would hit here, and it would bounce right back the other direction. This is called diffuse reflection, where everything's not kind of lining up properly. Let me use one more color here to try to illustrate this. What's going to happen is light was going to come in this way. It was going to try to go towards the center. It can't. It hit a mirror. So then it's going to go back completely the opposite direction. But a person that's over here is going to perceive it as though it came from here. And so if everybody just aims and looks at this location right here, if this person looks at this location, if this person looks at this location, and if this person looks at this location, you would then see a smaller upright image. And that's what you're perceiving. That's what this line diagram shows, is you're seeing an object that is smaller. If I were to then maybe take this stand right here and put it in front right here, I would bet that regardless of where you are in the room, can everybody in the room see the clamp stand in the mirror? Regardless of where you're at, right? Because we're all looking at the same spot. I am looking on this trajectory and somebody else has to look on this trajectory and somebody else has to look on this trajectory. And in a way, it's almost like you're seeing an image that's like behind the mirror right about here and you're seeing a little smaller image if you aim your eyeballs right here. That's how these ray diagrams work. We would then call this a virtual image. It's called a virtual image. And the reason why it's called a virtual image is because there's no actual clamp stand there. I feel like I'm seeing it kind of as though it should be behind the mirror. But like if I were then to come over here, oh, look, there's, there, there actually was nothing behind there, right? If I look here, I can see it in the mirror. But if I go just outside of where the, the mirror is, now I can't see it anymore. Therefore, it was virtual. It was like pretend. It was like my daughter seeing herself in the mirror. Can I try that again? Because this is really important. I, I'm going to actually just delete everything and try this one more time. Because you guys need to be able to draw these. Okay, let me try this one more time. Try to explain how this works again. This object right here, light is going to hit it from all directions. There's going to be some light that's going to go this way, some that goes this way, some that goes this way, some that goes this way. Light's going to go in all different directions. But one of the directions that really matters is any light that went parallel. Light that went parallel, I'll even use a different color now to help illustrate this better. Let's use uh, the blue line. Any light that went parallel is going to try to go through the focus. And so it's basically, it's going to go like this. 
Now, light didn't actually come from the focus, but if I drew some arrow lines, it would go like this. Light would have gone this way, this way, and then bounced like that. Right? So if there's a person standing over here, this person has to look there to see this. Everybody get that? A person standing over here has to look there to see this. I'll try another line, line diagram now. Another line is one that is the one that would have gone through the focus. But unfortunately, if it tries to go through the focus, as soon as it hits the mirror right here, it bounces out parallel. And so the way this would then work is that if I were to draw some arrows on it, light would have come this way, then this way, and then it would start bouncing back like this. And so therefore, a person standing over here would need to look straight in order to see this object right here. This person would have to look downhill to see this object. This person would have to look straight on to see the object. I'll do one more. So there's always three lines. If any light goes through the center, it always bounces right back on itself. And so by that logic then, any person that was standing over here, like if you're looking directly at it, you would basically just need to look direct. And so light would have come like this and this, and then it would have bounced right back the other way. Where did all three of my ray lines kind of converge? Well, regardless of where you were, whether you're over on the far side of the room, whether you're in the middle of the room, or whether you're me over here, everybody is all looking at the same spot. Where is that spot? Right here. You see that? Everybody has to focus their eyes at the same location. We then call this, this is known as what we call the image. We're all seeing an image right here. And we would then call this a virtual image. Because it's not real. There's not actually an object right there. And if there was a person that was over here somehow, and they were to look at this spot right here, would they see anything at that spot? No, because there's no mirror there. But if the mirror did curve far enough, then yeah, they would see that. I mean, this would have to be a pretty crazy bending angle, but yeah, if the mirror went that far, they would actually see that. Where do we use these mirrors, by the way, this big curved one? What, where's the really common location we try to keep them? What was that? <laughs> sure, that'll work. Yeah, anywhere that you want to have a big field of view, because you can see everything, right? Uh, we also put them on uh, um, um, side view mirrors on vehicles. If you're driving a big truck, and you need to be able to see beside you, these mirrors are great for that. Okay, um, I got 10 minutes left. I gotta show you the math for this now. There is two equations that fit with this. The equations themselves are very simple to use, but you've gotta really keep track of what is what, okay? The formulas are more or less just plug in, you're good to go. But you gotta know what the heck you're talking about. The first formula here is your typical um, formula for anything that's optics. This is your optics equation. The formula is one divided by your focal length is one over your object distance and one over your image distance. You might wonder, Chris, what the heck is an object and image distance? Let me show you on the previous example here. Right here, this was the actual object itself. I could measure how far away the object is from the mirror then what we're going to perceive right here is the image distance. Basically what we're saying is from here to here is a certain distance. From here to here is a certain distance. And it's kind of tricky because you're like, well, Chris, this thing doesn't even exist. I know, isn't that the crazy thing about physics now? Is we're trying to describe things that aren't even there. But if there was something right here, here's how far away it would need to be. This right here then would be known as DO. And this amount right here would be known as di. Okay. That's how one of these formulas works. The other formula is all about magnification. M stands for your magnification. Hopefully you'd agree in this example right here, this image became smaller. Right? It used to be this tall. Now it's only this tall. It's now become smaller. It has a magnification less than 1. Like it has a magnification of 0.6 because it's gotten smaller. The other values we can measure then is how tall is the height of your object. And this one right here, we can measure the height of your image. 
And, and if you can take measurements like that, we can actually calculate magnification. Uh, we're going to do a lab on this next week where we actually take some measurements like this and try to calculate uh, these lenses. So I think I just have one example left. One example? Two examples, and then we're going to call it a day. Um, here's another slide that's really important for notation. If anything is ever in front of the mirror, you need to use positive values. But if you're ever trying to measure something that is behind the mirror, you have to use negative values. What that would mean then is that when you're using this formula here, all of these values right here are positive, And everything that's on the opposite side of the mirror has to have a negative number to it. That's just the convention we've decided to go with. Okay, I got 10 minutes left. Let's try an example. Suppose you have a convex mirror. It has a radius of 20 centimeters. An object is 30 centimeters in front of the mirror. We want to figure out where the image is going to appear. I'm going to draw a bit of a picture just to help us get our bearings here. I'm going to draw a principal axis. I'm going to draw a converging mirror again. And it says it has a radius of 20 centimeters. So that means my, cent my center is 20 centimeters away. How far away is my focal point? 10. So somewhere right around here is my focal point, and it's now 10 centimeters away. However, in a diverging convex mirror, if you're going to put an object over here, like here's an object, which is going to be 30 centimeters away, okay, this is going to be plus 30, but your focal length is going to be minus 10. Because your focal length is technically behind the mirror, right? Where is the center of this mirror that you guys see right here? It's actually somewhere back here. And so therefore, it's on the opposite side of the mirror. It gets a negative number. Okay. I'm going to try using this new formula. The way this formula works is it's 1 over your focal length is equal to 1 over the distance to the object plus 1 over the distance to the image. Let's start plugging numbers in. This actually is, as long as you get your positives and negatives straight, it's like some of the most simple formulas we have. 1 over f, what's your focal length? Well, your focal length was 10. But your focal length's on the opposite side of the mirror, so this has to be 1 over negative 10. How far was your object from the mirror? 30 centimeters, so 1 over 30. Well, now all I need to do is to solve for 1 over di. So all you need to do is just basically do the algebra to solve for this variable, and we should be able to figure out where the image is going to show up. So I just need to grab a calculator, and we'll try the math on this. What do I got left? Five minutes. Okay, I'm going to be pushing it here. All right, um, here's how I'm going to solve it. I'm going to do 1 over minus 10 like this. I'm going to minus 1 over 30. And then I'm going to reciprocal this number to get di. That's kind of my shortcut as to how I'm going to write it. I'm going to bring the 1 30th to the other side by subtracting it. And then that's going to leave me with 1 over di. So if I reciprocal that, I'll get an answer. Minus 1 over 10, minus 1 over 30. And if I reciprocal that, I got this value here. Negative 7.5. What the heck does that even mean? Okay, well, negative 7.5 means that everybody needs to look, regardless of where you are. If you're over here, if you're over here, I don't care where you're standing to see this image right here, you all have to try to look at a spot that is about 7.5 centimeters away. So right about here, 7.5 centimeters on the other side of the mirror. That's where you're going to have to aim your vision. If one person looks here, they'll see this image right here. If this person looks there, they'll see the image bounce back to them. That's what that we just calculated for us. Let me just show you this with my line diagrams again one more time. And I think I'm going to have to call her quits after this example. We'll have to do one more example tomorrow. Let me show you these line diagrams. Let's say I took a parallel line right here. The parallel line would have emanated as though it came from the focal point. That's one. Another rule is that if an object was going towards the focal point, ooh, I didn't do this one very well. If it was going towards the focal point, 
it's actually going to come as though. Uh, let's do that one better, Chris. There we go. Now I did it better. Then what's going to happen for this line right here is light would have gone like this, like this, like this. It would have hit the mirror. It would have come back. But it would have emanated to a person standing over here. They'd have to be looking straight on, and they would see that it converges right here. Uh, the final line that you'd need to draw is, let's just use a black line, I guess, is if you drew it right towards the center, it would then bounce back on itself. And hopefully you guys can see, it's, this is a mess right now, but hopefully you can see that all of my lines are kind of converging right here, thereby giving me an image that is smaller and appears as though it's kind of inside behind the mirror. And the math now proves it, because that's what this formula now does for us. Last one, then we'll call it quits. The second thing it says is, let's say the object was five centimeters tall. So this object right here is five centimeters tall. How much would the magnification right here be? Is this thing going to be bigger or smaller than five centimeters? Smaller, right? Can we kind of see that everything in that mirror there looks compressed? With the interruption, if we could have the following students to the office at the belt, Ethan Anderson, Thomas Frank, Jaden Gurney, Hi, Oliver, Jake Jessen, Peter Vanity, Kobe Eagleplume, Antonio Granich, Sid Barkett, Owen Sanford, Alicia Jamel, Isaiah Clement, Mackenzie Summer. Let's the list. Yazi Hungry Wolf. Thank you. Okay, I'm kind of having to brief this last one. We'll have to pick this up tomorrow. I'm using the magnification equation, and right now I'm going to eliminate the H part of it. I'm not going to use that part right now. But the way this would work is that your magnification is supposed to be equal to negative di over do. Well, my distance to the image was negative 7.5, so a double negative makes it positive 7.5. My distance to the object was 30. If I divide the two, it's 0.25. Why does that make sense? Because it's less than 1, therefore my image is now a quarter as big as it used to be. It used to be this tall, now it's 25% as big. Okay, uh, we'll have to pick this up tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. This is a long topic, obviously. We'll uh, we'll pick it up more tomorrow. Tomorrow. I have a question. Yeah. So because like.